Well, as I said, it's uh, very good to be here uh, with you today and those who are watching at home. About 25 years ago, I was teaching Charlie at Ridley College, uh, Old Testament, and I apparently, he remembers this, I didn't, uh, commented that Jeremiah is the most sort of complicated book structurally, so it's taken Charlie 25 years to get back at me. <laughs> because you're doing a series on Jeremiah, and, uh, and we come to chapter 29 today. Well, let's pray. Gracious God, speak to us from your word, write it in our hearts, that in believing it we may trust you, follow you, and obey you for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, we cross now for an important news uh, break. The streets of Jerusalem are calm tonight, despite Babylonian troops still being in the city. Officials uh, close to the beleaguered king, Zedekiah, uh, have spoken out, uh, reassuring the population that Zedekiah is in full control despite the troops that are in the city. His spokespeople, who go under the name of prophets, have noted that the temple still stands, that Zedekiah is descended from the great King David, and people should have no doubt but that Zedekiah is in control and the people of Judah are safe and Jerusalem's future is assured. They went on to say that the attack by Babylon a couple of years ago was just really a minor glitch. But meanwhile, our correspondent in Babylon reports that Ahab, son of Kaliah, is urging people there who have come from Judah to exile to anticipate an imminent liberation of Jerusalem within weeks. And he was joined by Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, who called for those in Babylon to prepare for an imminent return to Jerusalem. However, sources close to the king in Babylon, that is King Nebuchadnezzar, are suggesting that Ahab and Zedekiah should be quiet or face uh, inevitable execution for their speaking out against his government. Nebuchadnezzar is calling their commentary fake news. Well, we are asking today our correspondent Jeremiah to make comment on these two positions in Jerusalem and in Babylon. Jeremiah is an outspoken prophet known for his fearless independence, and we have this scoop of his today to listen to. His views interpret these recent political events somewhat differently. Well, you and I are used to competing viewpoints about political and international affairs, even COVID affairs, all sorts of conspiracy theories, claims of fake news, differing interpretations of events and differing expectations, predictions and prophecies about the future. And so it was in Jeremiah's day. All through the book of Jeremiah, there are false prophets around speaking all sorts of other things. And Jeremiah was a somewhat lone voice of the day. Jerusalem, at the time of this chapter of Jeremiah, Jerusalem had been defeated maybe just two or three years earlier, re very recent. Their king then, had Jehoiachin, had been taken off into exile in Babylon and replaced by a relation, Zedekiah, also descended from King David, uh, as a sort of puppet king under Babylonian rule. But though Jerusalem was defeated, it was not destroyed as a city. The temple still stood. A Davidic king was still on the throne. People's lives were relatively much the same. Many of the leaders, the influential people, they'd gone or been taken forcibly by Nebuchadnezzar back to Babylon. And that was part of the ancient strategy of the Babylonians. That is, you take the leaders, the influential, the rich, take them away, keep them close to your own throne, Babylon, and therefore the conquered place, in this case Jerusalem, is less likely to revolt against the superpower of Babylon. That was their political strategy. But for those in Jerusalem, when they see the temple is still there, when they realize the king is still Davidic and on the throne of David, when they know the promises of the Old Testament about a temple, about a Davidic king, when they know the promises of Jerusalem standing firm, 
it would be very int- uh, easy for them, and it was, uh, that well, we're safe, all is well, Jerusalem's not going to fall, these Babylonians, it's a minor glitch, they'll, they'll be gone before too long. We're all okay. And as I say, false prophets abounded then as now. The false prophets tended to be populists, promoting the propaganda of the king. They spoke lies. So one of the things in this chapter that you may have picked up three times, Jeremiah speaks of these false prophets as being people who spoke lies. Jeremiah, like these other prophets, is claiming to speak in God's voice and under God's authority. Which is right? Who is right? So as we heard in the reading for us, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. You see, we all like good news. And these false prophets were bringing sort of good news, sort of easy solution. Babylon will be gone. You're okay. You know, settle down. Jerusalem's fine. Nothing to worry about. And that, that's an appealing message. That's what the king Zedekiah would have wanted them to say. There are two Zedekiahs in this chapter. It's a little bit confusing. One's the king in Jerusalem. One's a false prophet in Babylon. They both died eventually. Their message seems very plausible. Yep, the temple's there, king's there, people are still there. I I think we're going to stay firm, nothing to worry about. But what they failed to grasp was the disciplining and indeed punishing wrath of God against the waywardness of God's people. Now, for those who'd been taken to Babylon, That was in 597. This letter comes just a couple of years afterwards, it seems. They seem to be living out of a suitcase. They've been taken away as prisoners of war, basically. A bit like a refugee, no fixed abode. And it seems that though they're settled, it's a sort of house arrest. It's not prison, it's not slavery, but a sort of house arrest in Babylon. They're all anxious and expecting to be back very quickly to Jerusalem. But this famous letter shatters their hopes. See, Jeremiah's letter begins saying, settle down. You're going to be there for some time. Build houses and settle down. Well, you in this parish know that it took quite a while to build the new vicarage. That's not going to happen overnight. You can put up a tent in a couple of hours. But if you're going to build a home and settle in it, we're talking here about a bit of time. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Now, you've just planted out here along the new fence line in the parish. But imagine you've planted fruit trees. You're not going out after this service to pick the fruit, are you? That might be next year or the year after or the year after that. Fruit trees take a while to be fruitful. So when Jeremiah says, build houses, settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, he's talking about Think in terms of a, a bit of time here. But then he, then he pushes it out because he says in the next verse, marry and have sons and daughters. Well, you could get married pretty quickly. In Australia, three weeks notice is the norm. Uh, but then to have children, we're assuming you know, nine months more than that. Sons and daughters, plural children, maybe a bit longer than that. But then find wives for your sons and your daughters. We're talking about a generation now. So that they too may have sons and daughters. That is, we're talking about another generation. How long are they going to be in Babylon? This doesn't seem a very popular message. To think that those who've been taken away to Babylon are going to stay there for some time. And then when you get in fact to verse 10, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you. 70 years? That is, this exile is not just a a breath of air. It's not just a a temporary thing. We're talking here about something much more lasting and substantial. And so Jeremiah says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. There's a couple of things about that. 
the beginning of this chapter, uh, speaking about the people in Babylon, Jeremiah speaks of those whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile. That's the political reality. Nebuchadnezzar is the world leader of the day and he conquered Jerusalem and he took back to Babylon the conquered exiles. But now, Jeremiah says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. That is, God has carried you. You see, the theological reality is not that Nebuchadnezzar just happens to be powerful and we've got to put up with him, but rather that God has brought this about. It's not just that somehow this guy has appeared on the scene and, oh dear, he's taken some of our people off. This is God's doing. And that's not a pleasant message. Because most people then and now, like a God who's fairly benign, a sort of Santa Claus grandfather figure, who's no threat and no challenge to anybody, and that, was, that, that lay at the heart of the false prophecies in the book of Jeremiah and in this chapter. The gods are sort of benign, grandfatherly, happy sort of character. And Jeremiah's message about discipline, punishment for sin, 70 years of exile, is a little bit unpalatable. Who is right? When Jeremiah says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city, he's not here talking about how cities are important for strategic ministry. Often people read this verse as though, well, city is more important than the country. That's not the point. The point is Babylon, not Jerusalem. Seek the welfare of Babylon, not Jerusalem where you came from. It's not saying despise Jerusalem, but hey, you guys, you're here for some time. Don't just live out of a suitcase in a tent. Settle down, seek the welfare, be part of the community, Live here, you'll be here for some generations. Indeed, Jeremiah says, pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Imagine being told that. To pray for the conquerors who've carried you off into exile. Now, within six or seven years of this letter, the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem again. And this time they did destroy it. They utterly destroyed the city. The temple gone, the palace gone, everything just left to ruins. The people of Judah who were then left behind made another town to the north, their sort of capital city, because Jerusalem was basically uninhabitable. This letter comes in the middle of those two events. The first conquest, the city stood, but people taken away. And then the second conquest, the city destroyed and more people taken to Babylon. And when they were taken to Babylon, they sat down and wept. By the rivers of Babylon, we wept. How can we worship the Lord in a strange land? The psalm goes on to speak about happy will be those who who basically destroy Babylon in turn. And yet here is Jeremiah saying, pray. In effect, this is pray for your enemies. You see, pray for your enemies is not a brand new thing in the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. Here it is here. Pray for your enemies. Even those who've conquered you, maybe killed people you know. Settle down. You'll be there for a long time. In fact, the idea of increasing in number is an echo of Exodus chapter 1. If you remember in Exodus chapter 1, the people of Israel are in Egypt. They're now being persecuted by Pharaoh forced to work harder and harder. And yet, as that happens, they increase in number more and more. And we know the story of Exodus leads to their liberation to the promised land. So the echo here has the same point to say, you'll be in exile, you'll be in Babylon, you're going to increase in number. And just like it happened under Moses hundreds of years earlier, so one day it will happen. Because I, God, will come and you'll return to the promised land. This message of Jeremiah is... Not very pleasant to hear, I imagine, if you were in exile in Babylon. (laughs) But then Jeremiah says, I have good plans for you. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Well, this doesn't seem to be a pretty good plan, does it? 70 years in exile, under your conquerors, even praying for them. 
Yes, there's an implication here that the 70 years is a limit and therefore one day Babylon will go. That may be hard to imagine at the time because Babylon has conquered every other nation in the Middle East, in the known world of the day. Hard to imagine that it'll be defeated and gone as an empire in 70 years. Could we imagine that for China or the United States today? So Jeremiah says, I've got good plans for you. It's you, the people. It's not just you, the individual, as though God's got a special plan that you're going to do this and you're going to do that. But it's you, the people. And the good plan is 70 years in Babylon. Then I will come and I will bring you back to the promised land. Plans to give you hope and a future. But don't just think that the good plan starts in 70 years time. And meanwhile, we've got to endure this sort of hardship. The good plan is the whole plan. It's what I sometimes call Brussels sprout theology. Not everyone likes Brussels sprouts, but they're good for you. Did your parents encourage you to eat the green vegetables? They're good for you. It's part of the good plan. Brussels sprout theology. That is, the tough times, the hard times, the exile here, the COVID in our world today, the hardships that people, the hardships that Christians endure in place to place over the years, decades and centuries are all part of God's ultimate good plan. You see, what is good is not our ease or our comfort or our wealth or our indulgence or our pleasure. That's our, that's our world's desire. That's what our world thinks is good. But what God thinks is good is different from that. See, when God made everything, at the end of Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible, he saw everything he'd made, and behold, it was very good. And that's what God is still wanting to bring about. What is good. And these good plans are humbling plans for the people of Judah, the Israelites, who are in exile. You see, this is not merely a political glitch that somehow Nebuchadnezzar's got into Jerusalem and carried them away. And oops, it'll be reversed tomorrow or the day after. But rather, this good plan is to bring God's people to repentance for their sins. And all the way through Jeremiah, and you will have seen some of this in the series already, we read of their sins, of injustice, idolatry, adultery, and, and, and on and on it goes. God cares about those things. What is good is not just our pleasure. What is good is that we are humbled before God. An earlier Prime Minister of Australia said life was not meant to be easy. And nor does God say that. God knows that life is not easy. Very tough at times, and the last 18 months have been particularly tough, I think, for much of our world. But it is for our ultimate good. Our whole world, everything we confront, is ultimately for our good. The good of us together as a people, the people of God. And so Jeremiah goes on to say, Then you will call on me, God, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. In judgment, God, in a way, hides himself and doesn't answer their prayers immediately. But now he's saying that in time to come, the 70 years are up, you'll call on me. You'll come and pray to me. I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Maybe it takes 70 years to bring this people to their knees, to pray to God with all their heart. But I will be found and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and the places where I have banished you. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The emphasis is on I, God who will act. God who is bringing the people to their knees for their good. So that he can restore them with what I think you might see next week or the week after. A restored heart, a changed heart with a new covenant and the law written in the heart. You see, this exile, this first destruction of Jerusalem, the second that will follow, the exile to Babylon, it's all part of God's good plan. 
because God seeks what is our ultimate good. The language that's used here is part of echoes uh, Moses' words in Deuteronomy, chapter 4 and 30 of that book. That is, there's not something brand new here. Even Moses anticipated an exile and a return from exile. The language of seeking, praying, is the language of repentance. Literally, the word in Hebrew is about turning. There's no sort of theological word for repent in Hebrew. But the idea of turning to God, that's for their good. That would be for our good. That we may turn with all our hearts to a God who is both holy and merciful. See, what's good for them is good for us. And that is to be disciplined, reformed, humbled, obedient, turning back to God. The false prophets in Jerusalem, in the next paragraph, 15 to 19, they all think, oh, everything's going to be fine. But not so, says Jeremiah. That's false news. That's fake news. That's lies. It's a false hope pinned on a temple that still stands and a puppet king descended from David. But instead, Jeremiah says, quoting God, I will send the sword, famine, plague against them. I'll make them like figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten. Picking up language of an earlier chapter in this book. I'll pursue them with the sword, famine, plague and make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. And that happened within a decade. Jerusalem had fallen, scorned by the world. But the language there of famine, sword and plague is again, it's earlier Old Testament language. It's language that's associated with the judgment God promises if people are wayward in keeping obedient faith to his covenant. It's the language of Leviticus and Deuteronomy again. You can't claim what is good when you keep ignoring God's word. And the prophets have come time and time again, Jeremiah says, and you've, you've ignored them time and time again. And within a few years, Jerusalem fell. You see, the conquest of Babylon was not just a political glitch. It was God's doing. A God who is there in exile, a God who is there in Jerusalem, a God who is sovereign over Nebuchadnezzar or every international superpower, leader, president or commander of an army. God's good plans for us are not for our enjoyment but for our humbling to be holy. Most of us are quick to complain when things go wrong, quick to complain with COVID, with lockdowns, masks, or whatever it might be, quick to complain when the economy goes badly, we can't travel, we can't get back from travel. But God says, stop complaining, settle down, pray, and trust in the good that I'm bringing. You see, this same God has the same good for you and me today. We're not exiles in Babylon, but on this earth we are exiles and aliens, as the New Testament calls it. We're not in captivity. But what is good and the good that God wants for us, the good plans that God wants for us, are not our comfort, our ease, our pleasure or fun, but to humble us to repentance to conform to the likeness of Christ. That is good. It's why he made everything good. And why Jesus came to restore everything to be good. So Jeremiah is saying to those in exile in Babylon, as well as to those in Jerusalem, this is going to take a time. A time to be humbled so that you are ready to return back to Jerusalem and back to the promised land. And so God's good plans for us, I think, are that we who are exiles and aliens on this planet will nonetheless endure the hardships, difficulties, strifes, frustrations, futilities, and whatever this world throws at us, that we are being humbled and conformed by it to the likeness of Christ so that we will be ready, not to return to Jerusalem, but ready for the return of Jesus to take us to his eternal home. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you that you seek our ultimate good 
And you enable that through the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And we pray that rather than complain, we may settle down in this world, seek its welfare, humbled, repentant toward you and seeking you with all our hearts so that when Jesus returns, we will be ready to meet him face to face. Amen.